Okay, welcome everyone. So welcome to the Thing to Thing Research Group online summary meeting. So this is the first time we're doing this online. You all, all know because of why uh, all, all the meetings have turned virtual during these times. So my name is Ari Keranen and together with Karsten Borman, we are chairing the Thing to Thing Research Group. Quick note well, um, three main points. Uh, if everything works as expected, you are being recorded right now. You should also be nice and professional and welcoming to each other. And also the IPR guidelines of the IETF do apply to this meeting. For a more detailed version of the note well, you can have a look at the slides and the links here, both on the IPR guidelines and also the privacy and code of conduct. And a quick reminder about the goals of the IRTF. So this is not the IETF, but IRTF and the Internet Research Task Force that we focus on the longer term research issues of, of the internet. Whereas on the IETF side, the focus on the short term issues of engineering and standards making. So here at the IRTF, uh, we are doing research and not a standards or, or standards as in the IETF side. But of course, we do do a lot of collaboration uh, with the IETF on all of these topics. If you want to have more information about IRTF, you can look at the RFC 7418. Quick administrative. So we don't have physical blue seats on this meeting. However, at the end of the Etherpad, in the, the link that, that is on, visible in the WebEx chat, you have blue sheet and or attendance section where you can write your name and affiliation. I see we have note takers. We have Christian who volunteered. Thanks a lot, Christian. Uh, we also have a couple of persons in, in the chapter. If you want to be able to keep up with what's happening at Thinking Archie, the best way to do that is to sign up on the mailing list, thinkingarch.irdf.org. There's a link also on the slide how to do that. And also, as ha we have been having on all the meetings so far, we do have a GitHub repository with all the latest information about this meeting and also the materials uh, that are, are shown sh shared here. And the link is on the last line of this slide. The agenda for today, we are right now in the intro part. So we'll give a status update of, of the research group and also quick update on the upcoming meetings and activities. Then we have reports from various uh, things in RG and related activities from WISHI, uh, work we do with 1DM, and also a quick one on W3C Web of Things. Following that, Karsten will give a 1DM update and, and tutorial. And then the main part of, of the meeting is going to be on the Lars Eger giving a presentation about QUIC and IoT. Then we had three presentations about uh, work ongoing at the research group and also at the IETF side. So Mohit will present bootstrapping terminology. Uh, Tiro will present MUT or details profiles for IoT devices. And finally, Xavier will be presenting the IoT challenges and functions. Roughly that all should be taking about two hours before we can wrap up. Any questions or comments on the agenda? Um, I think, uh, as I will not be able to attend the second half of the time here, and that sounds interesting stuff I will be missing, uh, if you could issue the uh, recording link, that would be really helpful. Absolutely. We'll we'll find a way to share the recording soon after the meeting is over. So you will be able to check the recording from there. And also a um, quick reminder how we, on, on the queue management, since we don't have physical mic lines here, um, you can at any moment uh, put a Q plus on the WebEx chat and, and that way get a position in the queue. But since we are not a massive amount of people, and if you feel there's a natural time to chime in, you can also also go ahead and do that just like Hank, Hank just did. But it went there, if there's more ongoing discussion, it's probably easier to use the queue management and just put, put Q plus in the chat. Or if you need to remove yourself from the queue, if someone, for example, already covered your point, you can also put Q minus. And moving on, a uh, quick reminder about the Thing to Thing Research Group scope and goals. So just like at the IRTF large, we are focusing on open research issues. 
but in particular in this group we are focusing on the internet of things and how can we can make the real iot reality in particular we often focus here on low resource nodes and how we can bring those low resource nodes part of the bigger internet part of the bigger iot and as we are doing a lot of collaboration with the IETF side, we focus here on the issues that have opportunities for IETF standardization. So we start at the IP adaptation layer and work our way all the way up to the application and architectures, APIs, including management and in particular security. So we work with, of course, many IETF groups. Here's an example of, of two groups that we have in particular close collaboration with. So Whereas we do the research on the open research issues on the Tinting RT, for example, in the core working crew is, is a lot of the, where the protocol engineering for restful environments happen. And we have had many multiple topics moving between uh, Tinting RT and, and core recently. And then we have in particular another group called Elwick uh, that is publishing informational guidance about how to implement uh, IoT systems, in particular uh, on the constraint side. So right now we are in a summary meeting. Um, we have these meetings usually during the IETF week, uh, this time of course on online. And here we in general give an update on what has happened between the IETFs, what's, what's com coming next uh, uh, for the thinking research group. A lot of the actual work, uh, technical work happens in, in other, other meetings. So what we have coming next for thinking RG is that we have had this regular wishy uh, work on IoT semantic and hypermedia interoperability calls roughly on a monthly cadence, usually on, on, a, on one of the meetings, we decide what is a good time for the next meeting for WISHIP. Now we are planning one uh, next Friday, 24th. The exact time is still TBD. We have also had uh, online meetings, uh, commonly with OCF, OMS Becker, W3C, Web of Things. In particular, we had in a meetings with OCF uh, some weeks ago about their use of IETF uh, protocols and information and data also what we're planning we were planning for a physical meeting with wc web of things in june uh, co-located with the icwe uh, academic conference however that was also now turned into an online meeting just like all the other standardization meetings nowadays but you should be hearing more information about that shortly we are also planning a topic based meetings on selected one data model related issues somewhere in the May timeframe. The details are, are still open. And of course, at the next IETF, uh, depending whether that's going to be an online meeting or, or, or a physical meeting, we will have some activities co located. But we will have to wait until May about the decision if the IETF is going to be physical or online. We also have this um, uh, long standing plan to have more co-located meetings with academic conferences. We almost had one now in the June meeting, but unfortunately that was turned into, into online meeting. But hopefully next year uh, we managed to have something physically co-located with an academic conference. And if you have any ideas what we a good conference, perhaps you're organizing one, please do approach us chairs for more information. We're more than happy to talk with you. Moving on to the research group document status. Um, currently, we have we have published one RFC on, on security, and we have another research group document in the works right now called Restful Design for IoT. That one still has a couple of issues we want to clo have closer for before publishing it, in particular on offerings and discovery. Uh, we are now thinking if we should have a, a design team meeting um, with, with the authors and, and open for everyone else to join too, to really have finally um, able to close those issues and, and publish the document. Also, we have upcoming this Edge and IoT document. Uh, that's going to be a, a short update coming later today. And uh, we are now planning for that to be ready for research group adoption. So, of course, reviewers for that document would be more than welcome. Also, we have Secure Bootstrapping for IoT document, a short update coming in, in a moment. There are three other topic areas that we have had uh, discussions a lot, and there are also documents for a UP for describing binary data in legacy formats, variety of difference of core applications, core interfaces, and also layer three communication considerations. But they are not presented today, but they are topics that we have ongoing work. If you're interested in getting involved, uh, please contact the chairs. We can point you to the right people and write documents. Also, we are planning to 
um, make some of the wishy notes uh, into more formal documents. So in the in the wishy work, we have a lot of notes from the meetings. We have been turning some of those into wiki pages so far, documenting our learnings, for example, on terminology and architecture and engineering principles. And we have a plan of turning those some of those into research group documents also going forward. Then a quick update on the wishy activity. So wishy activity is something that the research group has has had uh, for the past few years already. It started with, with a, a workshop at, at the Prague IETF, and then have we have been continuing in, in various forms of, of physical and, and physical and online meetings. After the last IETF, we have had two online meetings uh, with two topics that have been in the, in both of those meetings. One data model has been very uh, much in focus uh, for both of those meetings. In particular, in one of we have been looking at one DM and how it relates to a lot of things, IoT schema, how these things work together. We have had discussions on how we do protocol bindings from one data model, and also how we build applications on one data model. So how you build a semantic proxy and what should the semantic APIs look like. But Karsten is going to be talking about one DM more in in a moment. Also, another bigger topic we have had it was this data model design considerations, and in particular, how do you do versioning of data models, and how do you handle the number spaces of, of data models? That seems to be a topic that is popping up right now in multiple uh, different fora working on data models, including 1DM. Uh, we've been trying to gather some common uh, knowledge and, and design guidelines for those topics. And a few words about the Wishy One DM hackathon. So we had a normally we have had Wishy hackathons as part of the IETF hackathon uh, in, in the face-to-face -face meetings, but now since the face-to-face -face hackathon was was cancelled, we had a, a virtual hackathon last week. Essentially, it was a four-hour WebEx session where we started with a show and tell session, so everyone who had relevant implementations could show them and, and see how they could be made to work together. Uh, we had, for example, implements of, of, of One DM and 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 web of things, thing descriptions, etc. We also had this proof of concept challenge. Um, the idea was that how could we build this semantic proxy that can work, uh, how can can facilitate interoperability between two different ecosystems? And the two particular ecosystems we chose for this challenge were the OMS spec works, like with M2M, if so, and OCF. And the idea was to have a an OCF application working through the semantic proxy only using information that is in the SDF, uh, one data model SDF models, and be able to communicate with the like with them to the device, for example, to read a temperature value. During these four, hour, four hours, we didn't quite get to the implementation details. However, did, we did manage to get uh, quite a bit refined prototyping plan, and we do have a set of components, uh, software components chosen for that. And we're going to be continuing putting those together and be able to uh, actually fulfill uh, this uh, proof of concept in, in the near future. If you're interested in joining this activity, please do let us know and we can we can tell you more about it and show where it's done. Also, before the IETF, we had a, a pre-IETF meeting. We have had this commonly in the past few face-to-face -face meetings on the Friday before the IETF weekend hackathon. And this one was focused on 1DM. Again, of course, it was an online meeting this time. Very, very similar topics as we have had in the wishy calls. So versioning, evolution of data models, data model and, and evolution of data model languages were in the focus. And in particular, whether you should use versioning or if features are a, a better solutions for the, for the same challenges. And how do you can make different versions or revisions of the data models, but also the language. We also did have a session on the 1DM technical issues. And of course, versioning of one data models in particular uh, was in focus, but that's that's still work in progress. But we are now basing that on the learnings that we have had um, from from various different other fora. Also, the whole topic of events, actions, properties, data definitions is something that we have noticed and needs more clarity. And we have been working on that in in many of the, of the meetings, including the pre pre IDF meeting. And then, given that this meeting uh, was uh, supposed to be co-located with the IETF uh, one. The topic there was this potential for 1DM language standardization at the IETF, but uh, Karsten will be going in more details on that 
If you're interested on in the details of this meeting, you can check out the detailed notes uh, on the link below. So that was all the updates uh, on Thinking RG activities. Um, before we go for the W2C Web of Things update, are there any questions or comments on the Research Group Activities update? And unfortunately, I don't see the WebEx queue while I'm sharing my screen. It's empty right now. Okay, in that case, then let's move on. Do we have Ege online? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Ege. Okay, um, so I have actually prepared some slides quickly. Um, so I'm just putting them in Etherpad. Um, and in case my screen sharing doesn't work. Okay. Yeah, going to the Etherpad might be a good opportunity to actually enter your name into the blue sheet because there, there are some. Uh, I put as number 15. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about everybody else. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Uh, so do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, um, so hello everyone. Um, I'm Ege and um, I'm a PhD candidate in Technical University of Munich and uh, also uh, in with Siemens. And I am in the um, W3C working group uh, on Web of Things. And uh, I mostly work on the uh, binding templates uh, document and uh, the testing aspects. So um, I would like to start with a small recap. So the current uh, charter and what we were working on uh, in the Web of Things working group, um, we were focusing on these five deliverables. Um, so the what architecture is a document that was detailing the different use cases for Web of Things technologies and uh, was giving the formal definitions. Um, so here we, we see that we can use Web of Things for um, connecting devices to the cloud, which could be, let's say, uh, like sensors or robots or even like uh, cars. And uh, there it, um, uh, it shows uh, what it would look like defined uh, behind some proxies or not, and so on. So it's uh, more of an informative document, which has some uh, more normative definitions. Um, I, I would say the core document uh, or the deliverable we have is the thing description document. And it is basically, um, what we use to represent the network facing interfaces of things. So, um, by the way, oops. Yeah. Um, so, network facing interfaces of things. Um, so, at the moment, it's a JSON uh, LD document, but it could be represented in other ways. Um, but in the foremost, it's a, it's a model. Um, so with the binding templates document, uh, we explain how we can represent different protocols of these things. So if a thing is using um, a HTTP core app or MQTT, how would it look like in a thing description document? And instead of uh, JSON, if I were to transmit XML, how would it look like? Um, in the scripting API document, we actually prescribe a, a scripting API. So how you can program a consumer, so the client applications, and also like a thing implementation. Um, so as you can see, all these documents uh, are linked here um, to their official W3C uh, recommendations. And lastly, we have the security and privacy guidelines, which is, uh, is a non-normative guide on, um, on how to uh, use the correct security uh, standards. So we don't prescribe on, so, so we don't like say that you have to do security this way, but it's more like uh, there are these security um, technologies and uh, you should use them in your application. Okay. Um, yeah, so as of last week, the April 9th, so since Thursday, uh, architecture and thing descriptions are W3C recommendations. Um, and the other deliverables are uh, W3C nodes, um, since they are more like complementary documents to the thing description and architecture. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so that was more or less uh, what has happened until more or less last week. Um, and uh, just for a quick reference, if somebody wants to quickly understand what is a thing description, it's basically this model that we propose um, where we have like the 1DM proposal, the property action and event affordances. Um, and we also have some metadata, human readable metadata. Um, we have some information on versioning, uh, different language support, um, and so on. So different security schemes. Um, yeah, but this is like a high level view of the model. And uh, what we have more to come uh, is that the working group is going on a small maintenance round and uh, we are aiming to release so what we call version 1.1 of the specifications. So it's basically some small features um, that were like uh, that we couldn't uh, finish until the release and uh, some things that were found during the, the last phases of the standardization where we couldn't change the standard anymore. Um, we have a new task force on the discovery. So how can we use different discovery mechanisms uh, in the Web of Things context? Um, we are working on more streamlined testing. Um, so how can we improve the, the current testing activity um, and like propose more online tools for this? Um, and we're also planning some developer outreach uh, sessions uh, where we uh, first show from our side uh, how can somebody develop a, a thing or consumer implementation and also would like to invite uh, other people to uh, come and explain their um, implementations uh, for like developers. Um, yeah, so this is my last slide. Uh, so if you want to have more information uh, about the standards, they are in the second slide as I shown. Um, we have this main page uh, that gives a, a little introduction into Web of Things. Um, we have our wiki where you can see the different uh, calls uh, we have and uh, the minutes of the calls, which are all public. Um, we have a, a library that groups different uh, Web of Things implementations. So you can go and look at the source code of some things and, um, and uh, their thing descriptions. Um, as with any W3C recommendation, we have to have a like a report uh, detailing the current implementations and how do they support the standard. And um, and currently, the we have a reference implementation to develop things, so like a library um, based on Node.js, and it's an Eclipse Foundation uh, project. Okay, so that was all from my side and. Uh, I'm very happy to answer your questions. And if some things weren't clear, just please go ahead. I hope it wasn't too fast, but I don't know how much time I had. So. Thank you, Eket. That was perfect. I see at the moment no one in the queue. Um, I think we can move, move on and um, want to hear more about that yeah feel free to reach out to Ege or to us and we can more than happy to contact you the right persons uh yeah i'll write my email uh actually okay thank you thank you again so next we have on the agenda karsten and with the 1dm update and tutorial and just a reminder for everyone uh please um don't don't share your video that will be consuming bandwidth from all of us, and that seems to be cars at the moment. And please keep your microphone muted if you're not talking or presenting. Thank you. Carson, go ahead. So I hope you see my slides. Yes. Okay, so um, this is a really brief tutorial about the one data model activity and the SDF format that is being created there. Uh, Michael Costa had a very nice uh, tutorial about this uh, at the Singapore IETF, or actually at the workshop we had ahead of uh, that. I'm not going to try to uh, redo his work there, but I'm going to take a slightly higher level uh, view and try to explain what, what are the uh, components and, and cogs and gears and, and how do they actually uh, fit into each other. 
So just as a reminder, why is it useful to do this? Um, of course, uh, it, it's always nice to, to have common standards, uh, but really the, the uh, motivation here is that we have a number of ecosystem-specific standards development organizations in the Internet of Things, and uh, each ecosystem has developed their own data models and their own way to document them. And it turns out applications uh, really have to talk to things, to devices from multiple ecosystems. So th there is no chance that a single ecosystem can supply all the devices that may be needed in, in a less than trivial uh, IoT application. Um, so uh, applications need to talk to all those, to devices from all those ecosystems or from many of these ecosystems and uh, why, why building protocol translators is possible, I mean, it's not easy, it's possible. It's actually even harder to translate the hundreds of data models that, that we have out there for, for the different uh, devices. And actually, no, nobody is, is really making money for <laughs> having a better, better data model than the other uh, ecosystem. So uh, it's not really something where, where people compete. Um, so, uh, at, at some point, uh, people from different uh, SDOs, standards development organizations, noticed this and uh, created a liaison group, which is an informal group of people from these different SDOs who talk to each other. And the idea is to bring together these, these hundreds of ecosystem-specific data models, express them in a common uh, format. Uh, and uh, then actually work on merging and harmonizing. It, it's really hard to merge data models that are in a, in, in a, a completely different forms. Uh, but once you have expressed them in a common format, you actually see, oh, this is redundant. And uh, our model is actually missing that part. And let's add that and so on. So this is really the harmonization uh, process. And, and that is, that is uh, just starting. I think that the, right now there is a single model where that actually has worked, but th that, that's really the, the main job here to uh, look at data models and look where there is potential for, for coming up with common uh, models. So the whole thing is, is done in the open. Uh, the, the data models will be available for, for all. It's a BSD license uh, behind them, so it's completely open source, uh, no strings attached uh, license. And uh, actually, even though the liaison group uh, still is, is a group of, of SDOs, which are mostly operating uh, un, under non-disclosure agreements, um, the, the actual harmonization work is happening in the open. So you can go to the GitHub repository, one data model, and, and find uh, things there. Now, I have stressed the, the need for a common format, and, and that's what I'm going to focus on for the next uh, 10 slides. Um, so uh, in order to be, able to, to be able to harmonize data models, we need to be able to express them in a con common format, and that's SDF. Um, so SDF stands for Simple Definition Format. Uh, usually all standards that uh, start out with the word simple in the name at some point have to lose that word. Well, th there is a certain hope that we, we actually can have a simple standard for once. Uh, and uh, there is a GitHub repository where you can look at the current state uh, of uh, development. So you, you heard uh, Ige talk about uh, the thing description, which is a format to describe a single thing. And SDF is a format to describe a class of things. So things with, with certain common characteristics. Um, and of course, th that's not that much different. So, so some of the things you, you saw on, on Egges' uh, slide will, will come up on my slides again. And of course, it's all the same people who are do doing this work. So there is a lot of cross-pollination uh, here, and, and we are trying to not emphasize the competition here, but actually the, the way how these things can, can work together. So um, IoT things don't have data. So it, it's a bit weird to talk about common data models for IoT things. Um, things have interactions uh, with their, their peers. And I'm going to use the word clients here. That's not a, 
uh, one DM term because it sounds like client server and we are going beyond that. But but bear with me for these slides that I call the, the guys who are not the things clients. So the, those things uh, those things offer uh, interactions that that can be done and we call them affordances. You saw on, on I guess uh, slides and it's uh, kind of popular to group affordances into uh, interaction patterns. So uh, right now uh, we are talking about property action and event patterns, and I, I'm going to go into those uh, uh, later. And of course, those those interactions actually do input and output data, and that's where the data, the real data model part uh, of the SDF model uh, come in. But you have to have the other parts, uh, the interaction part, so that these these data models actually uh, make sense in in context. So let's talk about those interaction patterns, um, property, action, and event. And uh, actually, most uh, protocol environments have something like that. And, and because people may be familiar with REST, I, I put in a, a column here uh, that, that has the REST name of, of that uh, interaction uh, pattern. And I also have a column that talks about the initiative, so who's actually starting uh, this interaction. And the final two columns of the table show uh, what, what kind of data is actually processed uh, while, while performing this interaction. And you can talk about input data and output data. So a property is like a, uh, something that, that is like a REST uh, get affordance. Uh, it can be initiated by a client and it gives you some output uh, data. But there are also writable properties, uh, which are properties that uh, also allow a put interaction. So that there are two different interactions provided by the same affordance uh, here, if it's writable. And of course, the idea is that uh, a property uh, put or, or set uh, actually changes something that, that is used by the thing uh, to do its work, like a temperature set point or, or color or something like that. Um, the the second group of interaction is is the action, uh, which uh, is pretty much a remote procedure call in, in the view of of many people. In in REST, we have the the post uh, primitive for that. The initiative again is with the client, and there is input data and uh, output uh, data. And, and these input and output data are, are different because it's not just setting a proxy here, a property here. It might be something like, like starting a process, uh, uh, making a coffee or something like that. So the, the uh, output data, of course, on the physical side will be the coffee, but on, on the side that we model here uh, will be the fact that the coffee is done and maybe some additional uh, information about it. And finally, there is the event, uh, which uh, is something that is not really supported very well by REST. Um, so the, 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 there are various ways of, of uh, supporting event-style data in various REST environments. Uh, the point here is that the initiative is actually with a thing. So in the REST world, that would be the server. And servers normally don't... Uh, uh, generate initiative. Um, but the whole point is that the event ha also has some, some data, which I call output uh, data here. Uh, and that is the third uh, pattern. So let, let's talk about those uh, uh, patterns in a little bit more uh, detail. So the action pattern um, is, is sometimes in some ecosystems, it's the only thing you have. You, you can send a command to something and you get a response and whether that was a, a, a property right or an actual action in, in uh, our sense here, uh, th th that's not uh, modeled. So here we, we uh, do uh, distinguish uh, properties, which are just data that, that can be set atomically, and actions uh, which uh, uh, do something, create an output that is re the result of an operation, and actually may um, take some time uh, to do. So an action 
may have a client initiate initiative to initiate it, but then it may only result in data uh, later. So it's, it's a little bit different from a property which always happens uh, uh, instantly. So this is the, the only uh, pattern we have where, where we have two different uh, data models that go into it. So I talked about uh, properties already a little bit. Let me just point out that SDF also has an observable property, li like the thing description uh, picture you just saw from uh, and And that's uh, pretty interesting because uh, with an observable property, the initial initiative again is with a client, but from then on, uh, it's the thing that tells you that there are uh, updates to this property. And you can see this is actually not much different from an event. So it's not quite clear how, uh, where, where the boundary between these two is. So let's look at the event. Um, th that's maybe the least well-defined interaction uh, pattern. Uh, but from a data modeling point of view, it's actually easier. I mean, it's not different from a property at all. It, it generates some output. And from the data modeling point of view, it doesn't make a big difference whether the client requests it or it comes uh, by, uh, uh, on its own by itself. Um, but th there are still semantic differences that we are not modeling right now. Uh, events might be like observable properties, just status updates, so the temperature changes, so you get an event that the temperature has changed. Um, or they may actually be more heavyweight uh, uh, occurrences where every single one of them is precious. So you might, might uh, model the insertion of a coin in a device as an event. And then, of course, uh, you you need to model the 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 fact that you cannot lose uh, these uh, events. So th there we have a little bit of of uh, uh, openness in the specification. But in the end, we define the output data, and and that's uh, what we focus on in, in the data model uh, work uh, for now. So let's talk about data. Yes. We, well, we have uh, again in the queue. Is it okay to take yes, question comments sure. now? Uh, yeah, so we also had this uh, discussion regarding uh, properties that are observable and observable and events. Um, and for now, like the the way we sort of like not really solve, but uh, we first of all leave it to the developer, but as a feeling, so to say, um, is that uh, generally the events are things that you. Um, like need some sort of a more configuration to set up. So like a, some sort of like subscription payload that you send and like set up some sort of a delivery mechanism. And then um, whereas in properties, then you would need to add more like sort of uh, um, like uh, information into how we would set up this thing. So we leave this kind of heavy event streaming uh, protocols to the event um, affordances. And also for observable properties, we sort of say that it reports only the changes to the property. So if you want to, let's say, send every second uh, the position of a robot, whether it changes its position or not, we would like imagine it's like an event stream. So that was sort of like a like a discussion we also had at some point, and I think it might be also useful for you. Okay, thank you. So um, yeah, it's interesting because uh, properties actually knowing that you have recent data about the property is is uh, different from not knowing anything so i think you are missing some some information in in that uh, modeling but let's not compare the things let, let me try mm -hmm. to yeah. explain what's there at the moment and uh, again the point is that in the end we we come out at a data definition and the the data definition uh, works by by saying what what kind of uh, uh, data should be there. So we, we have, uh, of course, we all know lots of, of data definition or schema uh, languages. And uh, data definitions can, if, if they are simple, be just put in line in an affordance definition, or you can put them separately into the specification because it's used by several uh, affordances and you don't want to repeat it 
uh, uh, everywhere. So right now, the, the data definitions in SDF can use a subset of the JSON schema org uh, terms they have in their validation language. And uh, they also can use some SDF specific terms. So for instance, you can say that the data has a particular uh, media type or content format as, as we call it, or you can say that, that data are nullable, have certain scale limits and so on. Um, so that probably requires a little bit of, of uh, a longer term discussion, how we actually evolve uh, these data format elements. Right now, this is pretty much based on, on uh, uh, what, what we found we could uh, uh, immediately uh, use. Um, I'm, I'm saying this uh, uh, from, from an academic point of view, from a practical point of view, we have a pretty good set of terms right now, so we can do work. But it's not really a set of terms where you would say, oh, yeah, obviously, that's, that's the way uh, uh, data definition should be shaped. So I expect some, some evolution uh, there. So um, from, from these uh, components, from, from the data definitions, from the affordances that actually make use of these data definitions, uh, we can build objects. So objects are just combinations of affordances. Uh, so uh, it, it just makes sense to, to have uh, several affordances defined together. So if, if you have a thermostat, you might want to have a writable property for the set point, but you might also want to be able to, to find out what is the current uh, temperature or is the heating on or, or things like that. Uh, so there are several interaction affordances uh, held by the same object. And these objects in turn can be uh, combined into things. So the assumption is that it makes sense to, to reuse object definitions in uh, things. And I think that's something that, that many SDOs have. And uh, things actually can reuse things. And um, I, I've uh, put a little green thing here, insert magic, uh, because we are still discussing how exactly to model a thing that's actually composed of uh, multiple things of the same class. So if you have a, a smart outlet uh, that might have a fuse, which you can read whether it's, it's open or uh, still uh, working, you can, might have a switch, uh, you might have uh, several outlets, uh, which might have properties like uh, uh, current flow, uh, and so on. And uh, the way these objects are put together to a thing that's uh, currently still uh, being discussed. But the point here is that we can build up a little library of objects that we actually can use to build things. And then in turn, ODM products are uh, combinations of, of things that um, are not harmonized, but that would describe the specific products you can, so you can find out uh, what STF definitions govern uh, the workings of, of that uh, product. So I've talked about the specification in abstract terms. Uh, the, the concrete specification is uh, just represented in uh, JSON because th that is the best way to actually uh, handle the specification with uh, tools. And these JSON documents are linked together with JSON pointers. We use JSON pointers also to, to uh, point in, into uh, specific documents, also for internal references uh, in, in such a, a document. And uh, the, the fact that you can point to things means, of course, that, that you can re reuse specifications from other uh, uh, elements, from other uh, specifications. And uh, one thing that might happen soon is that we define something like a basic call set that every specification can uh, reference. So these would be common reusable uh, definitions. So SDF, of course, is, is something that needs to be specified. Um, and uh, since SDF specifications are JSON documents, uh, we can uh, again use a data, a data definition uh, language. Uh, 
uh, to define how these JSON documents uh, look like, and that's currently using the, the JSON schema org uh, terminology. Um, so it, it's really important to be careful not to confuse the use of selected JSON schema org terms within STF uh, with the way we describe the syntax of, of the format. Um, in addition to the syntax, of course, we need semantics, and th that's currently just a text file and actually a markdown file to make it easy to uh, collaborate uh, on that. And there's also a, a, a nascent best practices document uh, that, that will define, define uh, not so normative parts uh, uh, so people know how to best use this. So, of course, in reality, when you develop something, there's also a lot of knowledge um, about uh, the, the semantics and the way things together, things work together uh, in the tooling that is being used. And it's uh, really useful to look at the tooling uh, that is used by the one data model uh, playground. There's a little uh, continuous integration uh, system there that, that calls a program that looks at uh, every SDF specification actually using two different uh, JSON schema org uh, style specifications uh, and, and also looks at other things like, like file names and so on. Um, and um, the next step, um, okay, I, I forgot I have one more slide. Uh, so right now we, we are in a situation that uh, we think the specification is stable enough to submit uh, data model. So we reached that state in, in Stockholm in October uh, last year. So several hundred data models are now collected at the uh, playground. And uh, more importantly, the ecosystem SDOs have started developing tools to convert their corpus to SDF. So many, many of, of the examples in the playground uh, are from these tools. Uh, right now, the, the uh, OCF uh, specs are missing because th there's still a little bit of work to do to make them work again, but uh, I expect a few more will be uh, in there uh, quickly. And uh, the, the use of tools is really important to make sure that we, we have good coverage uh, without creating enormous amounts of uh, work. So we, we have these data models coming up and we are learning a lot about uh, what, what data models actually need. The specification itself also needs some, some uh, cleanup. So in particular, the, the natural language uh, part of it uh, needs an editorial uh, round. And we are looking at a four-day online conference in the first weeks of May uh, to actually do this kind of work. So originally, we planned a face-to-face. -face. That's not going to happen. And uh, in order to, to get the work done, we will have uh, two hour slots uh, distributed over four days. Uh, so we, we make some uh, progress. And the whole thing, I think, should be completed by the end of May. Last slide. So what, what uh, are we going to do next? I said we're going to, to fix the language and so on. But I think the, the, the really interesting work is now to get tools done on the model consuming side. So we know how to produce these models, but th that doesn't give us a lot of uh, certainty that these models are actually useful. So we actually have to do work now building tools that consume these models and do something useful based on the information extracted uh, from uh, those models. So this is one of the points of the uh, Wishy Hackathon. And uh, I think one of the fun parts will be uh, seeing how SDF and, and uh, W3 what thing descriptions uh, can be combined uh, to, to make this useful. So thing descriptions have all these things like protocol bindings and so on that SDF actually doesn't have. Um, uh, so uh, it makes a lot of sense to, to work with those uh, together. Um, yeah, so a few things need to be. Uh, solve to get something like an STF 1.0, which would be an output of that uh, liaison uh, group. We can use those playground definitions to, to serve as a corpus in solving these uh, issues. 
And one of the interesting thing of uh, aspects of having um, all these models in one place is that if we make a non-backwards compatible uh, uh, change to SDF, uh, we can just go over all these definitions with a tool and and uh, change those definitions automatically, uh, so we don't have to be quite as afraid of doing non-backwards compatible compatible changes. So, for instance, we had a, a, a rare spelling of the word writable already in, in a previous version, and we have fixed that, and we could easily fix that because we could just run a tool uh, over all these uh, uh, models. So this this is something that, that uh, will be done uh, in, in the spring, early summer this year. And then, of course, the next question is, how, how do we turn SDF in, into a real-world uh, specification, so uh, we probably want to uh, find a venue for standardization, and uh, typically the ITF comes up as as a potential venue uh, there, and those are discussions that, that now uh, need to be held to find out, out whether the ITF is the right uh, place to do this, and, and actually wants uh, to do this. Questions? Hi, Carson. Uh, this is Mohit. So I think this all makes sense. Uh, who do you think would be doing the, the like, if I, if I am part of this ecosystem, uh, what's the motivation for me to like publish this in SDF? And, and then who would be then doing the proxies? Well, the, the motivation for publishing the ecosystem's specific specifications in SDF is that you want other people who are rounding out the ecosystems uh, with specifications uh, for the things that you already have uh, stay compatible to you. So you are kind of the, the uh, opinion leader for this particular uh, kind of uh, thing. I think that there's tang tangible value uh, for that, and one of the reasons why the ecosystem uh, people are so interested in, in making their specification available uh, quickly. So how do you actually work in this space? Uh, well, as I said, right now it, it's a liaison group, uh, so you have to be affiliated with, with one of the uh, ecosystems. Uh, to actually join the the the, the actual one DM meetings, but since the work is happening in the open, uh, you can just send a pull request to the playground and and submit things, and you can be sure that other people will be uh, looking uh, at that and give you feedback. Um, as I understand, that doesn't answer the question about uh, who is doing the proxies yet. Christian. Well, again, the, the people who are working in the specific ecosystems and, and are trying to make their specifications maximally uh, uh, useful, uh, these are also interested in, in uh, doing the proxies. First of all, of course, to uh, test out the SDF specification itself. Do, do we have everything in there uh, to build a proxy? Uh, but also do, to validate that, that the uh, ecosystem-specific um, side uh, actually can be done and, and nothing is, is missing there. Does that answer your question now? Um, yes. Yeah. Thanks. I would kind of kind of have expected an answer that says that one proxy would do this all from the specifications, but of course this won't cover the protocol specifics. Well, you 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 have to have protocol bindings for the specific ecosystem, so it's quite different to switch on a Zigbee light uh, than to, to do it using Coil. Um, so of course there, there are those proxies already. So IKEA sells a box that, that speaks Coop on one end and, and speaks Zigbee on the other. Um, so um, I'm, I'm sure that, that the people who build these proxies 
uh, will also enter the, the, the work at some point. But at the moment, really, the, the pushes from the people who have uh, all these hundreds of, of data models and want to make sure they, they work globally in the world of IoT and not just within the ecosystem. What we're doing okay, so for the demo is uh, we're using the, uh, or planning to use the uh, uh, U3C Web of Things uh, implementation in Eclipse Foundation called the ThingWeb Node Watt, which has protocol binding protocols that we're using already. So we're, we're basically planning to use the SDF model with uh, creating a subscription free the proxy that has its protocol binding that describes that protocol and then sort of have do the work in inside node what if you will to do the um, the actual proxy conversion by property or whatever we need to do good so thank you, everyone. It's very good discussions, but I'm afraid we're running a bit short on time. So maybe Lars can prepare uh, to present next. And uh, for everyone who's more interested to, on, on this particular topic, I, I recommend you join one of our upcoming Wishy 1DM meetings. So even if the 1DM, um, let's say, core work is happening within the liaison group, that is not open for everyone, the work we do in the Wishy group is open for everyone to join, just like any other things in our research group meetings. So. I recommend you join those and, and discuss this in more detail. So Karsten, any closing notes before we move to Lars's presentation? Well, that's pretty much the closing note I would have made as well. So uh, I think the research group is a good neutral ground to, to uh, do work in this space. And it's a fun research topic, I could say. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. Thank you, Karsten. Um, Lars, let's go next. We are a bit behind the schedule, so if you don't need your full half an hour, that's, that would be great. Yeah, I can make no promises because I have way more time <laughs> at NDSS. Um, how's the sound? It's okay. Okay, good. Um, and I'll try to share this thing. All right, can you guys see? Yep. Okay. Right, um, so this is a, a talk about a paper I had at uh, one of the NDSS workshops. I, I think it was called this, and then I also talked at the Quips workshop, which was on securing quick. So this is sort of the, the, the write-up uh, of a little sort of side experiment that it was trying to figure out if you could actually run um, a quick stack on an IoT device. And so what I did is I basically got the two uh, most featureful boards that I could find that also had Wi-Fi because I wanted to make sure that I could run something and, and uh, sort of saw how that worked. And this is sort of the, the write-up of the outcome. Um, I don't think I really need to really motivate why, right? A, this is a research thing. And B, right, if we could use quick on IoT devices or at least some IoT devices, we could sort of leverage all of the engineering that's being poured into Quick uh, and for IoT, right? And I guess this would be a good thing. Most people would agree. Um, it, it's also pretty clear that you you there, there's a line here um, in terms of device capabilities below which it's not feasible to do this. And, and we can argue whether you know it's it's feasible at all or not. But at least I could get it to run, as you will see. Um, the two things uh, are, are part of this this quick stack, right? So on, on the left-hand side, warp core, this is basically, um, it's an UDP IP ethernet stack that I originally wrote uh, on top of NetMap for data center networking purposes. So it's, it's basically meant to be as fast as possible. So it bypasses the kernel, it, it writes straight to the NIC. It easily fills a 40 gig um, path with um, you know a single core with a single slow. It's pretty small, so it's it's and it's obviously not uh, fully standards compliant, but it can fake it enough to, so that you can speak to arbitrary hosts, or at least sort of mostly. So it's like three thousand lines of code, and it's another three thousand if you actually use NetMap, which we don't for these IoT devices, obviously. 
Um, it, it also has a socket backend, which, which I use for two of them. Um, and it sort of exports a, an API that's zero copy, which is also nice because I thought that would be useful for IoT. Um, it turns out um, the operating systems that I used, uh, which were Riot and uh, Particle, uh, have no zero copy sort of mode of operation, so that was useless. By the way, since I don't see the question QR, if you want to interrupt me at any point and, and see if there's any questions that people want to ask, or people can just interrupt me themselves, we can do this. Um, right. So, so as I mentioned, I've, I've, I've got two boards. One is a particle argon. The other one is an ESP32. The argon uh, has particles, what's called device OS on it, which has LWIP, which is nice, right? So you can basically just run this warp core thing on top of LWIP socket emulation, and, and that that's good enough. Riot has this thing called GNRC, a gener generic network. I don't know what the R is for and what the C is for, but it's basically its own IPv6 stack and it has a bunch of problems. Um, most of all, um, it doesn't let you wait until a packet arrives. There's no poll or select. It doesn't have IPv4. And, and I, unfortunately, the LWIP port, which exists for Riot at the time I tried to use it, was broken on the ESP32, and so I, I couldn't use it. So for, for the Riot um, implementation, I, I hacked together a very bad um, warp core backend that speaks to GNRC um, and sort of fakes pull and select in ugly ways. Right, so that's that's basically packet IO. So this, this lets you send UDP, IP, and Ethernet packets. Um, quant is the quick stack. So, so this is a thing that I've been, I'm, I'm chairing a quick working group for those of you who don't know. And, um, one thing that I quickly realized is I wanted to be sure that what we were standardizing was actually implementable. And so I decided I'm going to do a little toy implementation along the, uh, you know, along the specification process. And that's been going on like for three, four years now. And I've been doing this since version like seven or 11 or whatever. So it, it's, it's come a long way. Um, I would not recommend you use this for anything production related, but you know, for playing around, it's fine. Um, it's about 10,000 lines of code when I, uh, did this experiment, which was a couple of months ago. Um, again, the focus for, of Quant is actually high performance data center networking. So I'm interested in how fast can I make Quick go. But it turns out um, because it runs over this warp core packet IO background, it's actually reasonably portable to IoT devices. And it's not optimized at all for IoT, neither is warp core, by the way. But um, it turns out it, it's not terrible. So it, it uses a bunch of data structures that you normally wouldn't want to use on an IoT device. So it uses K hash, for example, right? It uses timing wheels, it uses uh, splay trees from FreeBSD, it uses bit sets, and, and it uses Kazuo's uh, Pico TLS implementation, which is a reasonably lightweight TLS 1.3 only implementation that uses um, has, has two uh, crypto backends. One is OpenSSL, which obviously doesn't make a lot of sense, but it also has what Kazuo calls mini crypto, which uses Cifra and micro ECC for the crypto operations. So it's, it's not terrible. Um, and so I wanted to sort of figure out, can I run this thing? Um, this is sort of a little bit of a um, overview slide for those of you who don't know these boards. On the left-hand side is the Argon, on the right-hand side is the ESP32, you can see that they're reasonably powerful, right? So the, the Argon has a ARM Cortex M4 with floating point. Um, it runs at 64 megahertz, right? It has an FPU. It has, it, it even has an ARM trust zone, which for the measurements here doesn't matter because um, it's not exposed by particle to user application. So I can't use it from, from Pico TLS. It has quite a bit of RAM and quite a bit of flash. And, and again, this was because I wanted to make sure I could run something. But I didn't want to like do the work and then realize I, I got the wrong uh, board to actually run something on. Uh, and it does wireless LAN. Why? Because also easy, easy experimentation. On the right hand side um, is an ESP32. I guess most people have seen these. Again, it's it's pretty powerful. Um, it comes so so um, this um, Argon uh, device OS is free RTOS based and and the. Uh, uh, normal uh, expressive development kit is, is the same, right? But I didn't want to compare like two free Arto space systems. So I decided I'm going to run Riot on the ESP32 just because it's supported and, you know, to get a little bit of a different operating system in there to make, to see if it makes any difference. So I used Riot as of the release from last October. Uh, both of these tool chains are, are pretty old, right? Uh, given that, that GCC9 is out. So, so um, and, and we'll see that 
that there's some issues with uh, link time optimizations that don't work for both of these, which might have made the footprint a little bit smaller. So those are the boards. Um, right, so, so measurements. So maybe now would be a good time if there's any questions about anything I've said so far. All right, I guess not. Let's look at the measurements. I'm, I'm basically going to first talk about um, sort of the code and static data size, meaning you know, how much flash do you need to consume to run quick and, and TLS 1.3. Um, so I'm going to do a baseline build first. So this is basically, um, so, so both Quant and Warp Core have a bunch of things that um, sort of are already pretty small in size, right? So, so they, they, they already, you know, if you just compile them, um, you can you can get them to uh, use just a, under 100 kilobyte of, of flash, which is great. So I'm going to show you two um, stack diagrams. On the top um, bar graph is the argon numbers. On the bottom is the ESP32 numbers. Um, and the, the bar graphs have like three major colors, right? Green, red, and, and purple. Green is... Um, the size of the TLS stack, red is the size of the quick stack, meaning quant and warp core. Purple is the application. You will see here that the application for the argon is a little bit bigger than the application of the ESP32, which you can't see at all really. Um, that's because on, on the argon, um, I, I had it first and I had more time with it, so I, I stuck some stuff in there that you know turns on the LEDs and makes it reply to button presses and so on. So there's a little bit more application code there. Basically, all the application does is, is it does a get for a 5K object to um, a web server, an HTTP3 server that's running on my, my laptop. Um, and you also see that there's sort of dark and light green and red. So the, the dark red is quant, the quick stack. The, right le the, the light red is warp core, which is the packet IO. And obviously, you know, the majority of that red is, is going towards the quick functionality. Packet IO doesn't really need a lot of uh, bytes for the code. Um, for the TLS stack, um, the dark green is the TLS 1.3 stack. And the uh, uh, darker of the light greens is uh, Cifra, and the very light one is micro ECC. So you can see that about a third of the TLS footprint goes towards the crypto operations in at, at the baseline, which is quite substantial. So if you could use um, the hardware crypto that's available on both chips, you could already sa you know, save a whole bunch of space right there. But that's the baseline. So we, we compile them. And for both of those platforms, you end up under just under 100 kilobyte for uh, something that runs and, and downloads an object over quick, which is not terrible already, right? Um, but let's see what we can do. So the first thing I did is I um, did some 32-bit optimizations because neither of those uh, chips is 64-bit. And, and Quick really wants you to run on a 64-bit platform. Um, it has a bunch of um, arithmetic that is sort of 64-bit math. Um, the nice thing is you can avoid most of them, right? So the, the most expensive thing is division and modulus, which you can sort of eliminate my code at least because it's all... Uh, by constant, so you can, you know, some bit tricks and you can get rid of that, which is nice. It saves a few kilobytes. Um, I'm using 32-bit widths for a whole bunch of internal variables for Quick that are, you know, 64-bit wide in the specification, like packet numbers. But I chose to just use 32-bit widths because for on an IoT device, right, how likely is it that you're going to send more than 2 to the power of 32 packets over a single flow? You know, practically zero. Um, and that sort of... Um, Sort of, you know, already brings down the code size by like 5k, let's say. So that that's pretty good, right? Um, and, and we haven't given up much sort of standards compliance, quote unquote, yet. Um, next thing, so so Quant by default is a server and a client library, so you can run, you know, both at the same time if you want to be a proxy. Um, so I, I made the assumption that on an IoT device, maybe you just want to be a client, right? I don't really see a need to run a quick server on an IoT board. Um, if people want to do that, you can measure it. I haven't, right? But if you are basically dropping server mode um, for both TLS and for Quick, you you get a really big savings, right? You're going down to uh, under 80K, 75K for um, ESP32. So you can specifically see that the TLS um, savings are quite substantial. You're almost gaining like 10K, just getting rid of all that server side TLS processing, which is quite nice. Um, 
the other thing that starts so quick has this mode where you can uh, use zero length connection identifiers and if you're a client and if you don't expect to be uh, switching network attachment points it sort of makes sense to use this and and um, in client mode i also enabled that so the, the savings at the quick layer are actually due to using exclusively zero length connection ids it lets you eliminate a bunch of structures that are used for um, matching packets to connections based on a connection identifier instead of uh, IP address and port. Uh, next thing, right? Um, TLS 1.3 has a whole bunch of uh, crypto things, uh, crypto algorithms that are sort of mandatory um, and or uh, suggested or, or um, what's the RFC 2119 term? Recommended, whatever. Um, so if, if you're as a client, right, as a server, you, you do want to speak all of them. As a client, you can sort of choose not to and still interoperate with all servers, um, which is nice. So basically, I'm, I'm leaving uh, AES-128-256 as a cipher suite and one key exchange. Um, why um, AES? Because Quick uses that for packet protection already. So you, if you want to speak Quick, you need to do AES to protect your packets. Um, and so it makes sense to use the same crypto also at the TLS layer, right? Um, we can have an argument about whether, you know, something lighter weight than AES or, or you know, would, would be useful, like something elliptic curve, but this is the reality at the moment um, because packet protection is only that one cipher. You, you, you just will use the same one for TLS. So we're getting more gains at the TLS layer. Now specifically, we're getting uh, quite a few gains also um, at the Cifra and Micro ECC layer. We get, we're down now to 27 to 26 uh, kilobytes for um, TLS 1.3, which isn't terrible, right? And as I said, if you could use the hardware crypto, you can eliminate the bottom half, the, the two light green uh, bars, and you could you know, get, some, get some more uh, reduction. And sort of, this is safe from compared to the baseline between like 25 and 30 percent already, which not a whole lot much loss in functionality. Um, the next few numbers I'm going to show you is if you disable more stuff, but but you give up some things in terms of functionality or spec conformance. So um, Quick has this thing called connection migration, where um, if your NAT rebinds or you want to switch from one interface to another interface, you can do that, and the connection survives that. That I would claim is sort of unnecessary for IoT use. So if you turn that off, you get another few kilobytes of uh, code reduction at the quick layer. Um, so if quick has um, connection close uh, frames and they have a reason field um, that you can take arbitrary text and quant by default is quite robust in using that. So whenever it sends you connection close frames, it puts like a string in there. It says, here's why I closed your connection. And obviously those need to go into the static image somehow. So if you if you don't do that, um, then the not for protocol uses you're only there for like human admins to look at. Um, if we don't do that, we save another few kilobytes because we don't need to carry those strings. Um, Quick has a feature which is a stateless reset, which means that um, I can tell you I'm gonna send, if I have lost state for a connection that we had, I'm gonna send you this um, random number instead in some way. And that is for you a signal that I have I don't know who, who you are anymore. And obviously I can I can compute this thing based on a packet that I see coming in from you. Um, so that, that lets you basically um, drop state two um, rather than keep retransmitting and eventually timing out. But it's an optimization and you don't necessarily need to do this. So if you eliminate that code, it's another one or two Ks that you are um, saving, but you're forcing the other guy to potentially re retransmit more. Um, so there's uh, support for dealing with reordering in, in Quick. There's sort of two things that you want to do. There are zero RTT packets, which are, if they're reordered, it would be nice to cache them uh, so that when you have the keys for them, you don't need to appear to retransmit them. So you need to store them in some data structure. And if um, you, know, you don't do that, you have more gains, but potentially you have a little bit of a drop in performance if there's reordering. Um, and you can just drop all reorder data rather than, uh, you know, keeping it around uh, to deliver it uh, when it's in order. 
And that again forces the peer to retransmit that, but lets you uh, drop some data structures again. And so this is sort of the, the the final thing that I did, right? So you can see you can run this thing now in, in 63 kilobytes to 58 kilobytes for the R, the ESP32, which is actually quite good, right? So you so in, in around 60 kilobytes, you can get a full TLS on three stack, including software crypto, and you get a quick stack. Um, and I should have said earlier that that quant does not implement HTTP3. So it it implements sort of a TCP TLS like um protocol it's a transfer protocol but it doesn't do http3 so if you wanted to actually do http3 you probably add a few more kilobytes for an h3 stack which i haven't done um there's some other things that i did oh there's one more so so there's also this tcp like connection information structure that quant by default keeps around so you can see like what happened to this connection you know how many frames were transmitted how many packets and if you don't want that on an iot device you likely don't you can compile that out and you're gaining a little bit, not a whole, or not even a whole kilobyte. And that's my final slide on this. Um, so that's it for the static sizes. Um, what about stack and heap usage? So again, I'm gonna show you two, um, the same two sort of um, diagrams. This time they're not bar diagrams, but they're actually uh, just dot plots. Um, so I instrumented the binaries uh, to log stack and heap usage on whenever a function is entered and exited, um, and specifically log this out over serial. Um, the, you, you can imagine that that gets very noisy very quickly. And um, I, it, it actually became so noisy uh, that it, it, it didn't terminate uh, in any sort of sane amount of time, like in less than a day. So I, I dropped, uh, instrumentation of the crypto functions. Um, one, because you could argue that if you had hardware crypto support, you wouldn't execute those anyway. Um, and and they're, they're very frequently called and they have very many small functions. Um, so what I show you on the right-hand side is actually the lower bound of the stack use and heap use. Oh, uh, no, specifically stack use because I don't go into those uh, functions. Um, and I'm not showing time units on the x-axis, and that's by default because I'm actually exporting this over the serial line. Um, so it's, it's meaningless, right? It takes it takes sometimes an hour or two uh, to do one of these runs. So there's there's no performance to this. Just look at it as time. Um, there's sort of uh, and I removed random 20% of the data points uh, to make the overplotting a little less severe, so you can see a bit more what's going on. Um, there's three sort of, actually not three, there's five phases to these graphs, right? There's a dark red, which you can barely see on the very left, which is the, um, you know, the, the initialization phase. You can see it a little bit better uh, on the ESP32. The initialization phase on the argon is much shorter because on the argon, the application, quote unquote, gets started once uh, the device is attached to the base station, while on, on the ESP32 under Riot, um, that thing already counts towards the application runtime. So um, you can see these few sort of dots that are there in the init phase on the bottom on the bottom graph, which is you know when functions get called while the thing is trying to find the Wi-Fi. Um, so that that's pretty flat there. Uh, the interesting thing is during the open phase, right, which is when you actually opening your quick connection to the server, and you can see that that's really when the stack usage is is highest and and it's pretty bad it's uh certainly reaching three kilobytes and and since i don't plot the the part in cifra and micro e micro ecc it's actually worse it's actually over four kilobytes because those have quite a few uh stack uh hungry functions that they use which is pretty bad on on device os the default stack is 6k so it's actually okay to run on riot it's 1k so it, it crashes so we need to compile Riot with a larger stack to make it run. Um, so that is that's pretty bad. And and part of that is due to Pico TLS, which has a bunch of functions that also use large stack allocated variables. And part of it is also, as I said, due to this um, um, public key crypto stuff, which is not super great. And, and you can see that the public key crypto is worse than the symmetric key crypto because during the green phase, which is the, the data transfer phase, um, the stack utilization is, is way lower than during uh, connection open. 
which is nice, but you can't buy anything for that because the worst thing, or the thing that actually matters is the worst case. You know, you don't get a cookie for using uh, less stack on average. And doing connection close, you again, ramp, ramp down. So it's it's not super great, right? Stack usage could certainly be improved. Uh, and, and I was quite surprised that um, crypto libraries like micro ECC that specifically like claim that they are meant for embedded devices then use a couple hundred bytes of stack allocated uh, space. Anyway, but if you if you could use the hardware crypto, that wouldn't happen. Uh, he, so I actually went through all of this already. So I'm gonna just, uh, you know, zoom through these. Heap usage. So this is again uh, over the runtime. And you can see that in the initialization and close, there's a little jump there in blue. Um, in heap utilization, that's because warp core uses um, statically allocated packet buffers, and that's where they get allocated. And for this run, we use 15 buffers at 1500 bytes, which translates to that, that arrow there. Um, one thing you'll see is that the, the baseline heap usage on the argon is somewhere around almost like around 96 kilobytes, while on, on the ESP32, it's, it's below 32 kilobytes. That's because um, device OS actually in the background in another thread has a full thing running in parallel to the user application that connects uh, the argon to particles cloud and lets you do firmware updates and do all kinds of stuff. So, and that obviously has a footprint both in terms of not having as much flash available as you think you had when you bought the device. Um, and you also don't have as much uh, RAM or heap as you think you should have because the device always takes its, its chunk. Um, otherwise, sort of what, what's notable is that um, during the open phase, right, uh, heap is slightly increasing, but it's not terrible. There's no large jumps. And that's because a whole bunch of sort of connect per connection stuff gets allocated. Ideally, you want to have all of that statically allocated, but because this is not IoT code, I have dynamic memory allocation, but it's not terrible. And during the transfer phase, what's nice is it stays flat, right? So no spikes, which, which, is, which is great. And then stuff gets deallocated and you're out. Finally, um, energy and performance. And I should say that these are probably the, the hand waviest measurements I've done. Um, so the, the, the energy measurement was only done for the argon. That was because I, I didn't have a battery for the, the ESP32. And I don't even know if it has battery pins. I, I got it so late that I couldn't play with it much. Um, so I had one battery, <laughs> which is a 2000 milliampere LiPo battery. Um, and I uh, did exactly two runs, and that's because each run took like three days or something like that. Um, so I, I charged that thing fully um, at, at close to, to at the same level as I could manage. And then I'm uh, basically have the client run a series of get um, requests for 5K objects, uh, one after the other until the battery runs out. Um, and, and what I'm reporting is um, the self-measured, uh, I should say, voltage of the battery. The argon can measure its own, own voltage, and there's a whole um, question about how accurate that is. But it sort of, you know, it, it goes down over time. Uh, there's two runs. I wanted to see whether quick zero RTT connection resumption makes a difference. So blue is everything uh, runs with one RTT handshakes. Um, red is you run exactly one one RGT handshake at the beginning of the connection and for, or at the beginning of the run and every subsequent connection does this, the zero RGT connection reestablishment. Um, this ran for two and a half days, as I said, and you know we get just under thirty thousand one RGT connections out of the battery before it dies, and just under thirty two thousand zero RGT connections. So there is a battery benefit to doing zero RGT, which shouldn't be surprising. Since you know it eliminates some processing from the handshake and so you know saves some energy, um, but it's very preliminary. Uh, but not sure. But I wanted to include it because I, I found it kind of interesting. Um, performance is um, was measured during the same run that I just showed you the energy measurements of. So for each of those thirty thousand and some connections, I uh, took the time and, and the median one RTT connection took about 5.1 seconds and the median zero RTT connections took about 4.74 seconds. So 
it's you know 0.35 seconds faster to do zero RTT, which is nice. Um, there's some open questions around this. Sort of, the, if, if you uh, look on the graph there, um, zero RTT does show a little bit more of a slope uh, compared to one RTT, which is pretty much a straight line up until the 80, 90th percentile. I don't know. I need to look at why this happens. I would have actually expected the, the, the opposite, but but there you have it. Um, and and one RTT is sometimes faster if you look at the very bottom, right? There's the the lines are crossing, and that I don't quite understand either. So there's some you know future work here. Um, there's actually quite a bit of more future work. What's my time? Um, lots, right? So in terms of measurements, you know, data upload isn't done. Uh, there's almost no varying of any parameters of these measurements uh, in terms of objects, sizes, streams, connections, and so on. We're not comparing against anything else, right? Neither TCP nor TLS nor CoAP nor something else. Um, there's nothing about different boards or different operating systems. The energy measurements are pretty pretty rough. On the implementation side, there's lots that could be done, right? I said I don't do HTTP three at the moment. Um, that that could be included. Pico TLS could be improved quite a bit. Um, better data structures could be used that are sort of more optimized for IoT usage. Hardware crypto, I think, would be the, the, the highest on my list, actually, in terms of performance and energy savings. Um, do we actually, you know, what if we just didn't do zero RTT? Could we shrink uh, down the code size more? Um, I would be interested in looking over on, to IP over BLE or, or 802.15.4. Instead of wireless LAN, um, just sort of as, as a cookie, right? So on the ESP32 with Riot OS, the wireless LAN driver is 115 kilobytes, uh, which is 45% of the stuff that you need. So 45% of the entire size of Riot is for the wireless driver for the ESP32. So I'm hoping, for example, that BLE or ADOT15 have sort of saner drivers. Um, and, and the question is, you know, can you actually scale this down to, to, to smaller devices? And, you know, my, my gut feeling is you probably could. If you were to build a quick implementation from scratch for IoT, you could probably do it in half the space that, that I use, sort of maybe 32 kilobytes or something with TLS. And that, I think, would be pretty cool. Um, and that's all I had. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Mohit is first in the queue. Uh, hi, Lars. Uh, thanks for this excellent presentation. As uh, chair of Elvig, of course, we would be happy to host this work there at some point when you wish to bring it there. Uh, so uh, some technical comments. I think I, even though maybe some of the REST community will disagree, but I am fine with this, that the IoT device is a client that initiates connection, but then you're also saying that maybe zero RTT isn't so useful and we can drop that. Whereas I would argue that if the device is the client, then zero RTT makes, uh, it makes sense to have it there because uh, uh, like any, like the amount of energy sent uh, co or consumed for sending any packets or receiving any packets on the radio is much more than uh, energy that you spend on doing local computation. And if you can like save on receiving and sending packets even at the cost of doing some extra computation or having some bigger flash size that's uh, my gut feeling is that's probably better so yeah, yeah I, 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 I agree. i'm not sure uh, we should drop uh, zero rtd i think we should do that uh, second comment this hardware crypto of course if the board like provides support we should definitely use it uh, just to get an idea of like like how far can you go if you have hardware support? Uh, and then the third, I guess your future work was saying about 16-bit. Uh, I wouldn't do that. I think it's almost like very hard to find 16-bit microcontrollers. So, and I mean, there's no point. I think the 32-bit the like ARM Cortex-M3 are uh, sometimes more energy efficient than any eight or 16-bit microcontroller. So I don't see any point going down that path. And of course, yeah, BLE or 15.4, uh, quite happy to see uh, results on that in the future. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, 
Thank you for this presentation, Lars. Mohit, you are next. And for the upcoming presentations, if we can steal three to five minutes away from each of your time, then we might be able to still end this on time. All right, I will try to. I, I will try to take less time than than I was allocated. Do you see the slides? It started to share. I see a blank screen. That might be the WebEx bug again. Does anybody else see those slides? No. Starting to share. Moit, can, can you cancel and try again? Sure. If it doesn't work, I can share your slides. Do you see them now? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. So yeah, hi. Uh, uh, I'll be presenting this draft on secure IoT bootstrapping. We are on version eight, but uh, the last few versions we didn't really update anything in the content. They were just keeping the draft alive. And this version we have made some some updates. This is joint work with my co-authors Bechet and and Dan. So. What's the goal of this document or what's the new goal of this document? So before we were just trying to kind of document what kind of bootstrapping me mechanisms uh, exist and, and there are pl plenty of them in, in, in the IETF and outside the IETF. So uh, the goal of this document was just to document them. And of course, like then we had like more questions like what does bootstrapping even mean? How do you define bootstrapping? and there is a bunch of related terms that are used for example onboarding commissioning and so on initialization how are they related and how are other people using these terms so one of the goals of this document is just to see like what are the related terms and how they are being used and possibly identify some common patterns and, and provide recommendations that perhaps maybe we at the irtf or ietf should should be using these or favor favoring these terms over some other more obscure terms. Uh, and then like, of course, we, we still continue with the original goal of providing examples of bootstrapping techniques. Uh, we cover, we will try to cover all IETF and several non-IETF protocols, knowing that, you know, we can't cover every, every bootstrapping technique that, that exists and perhaps maybe try to see if we can classify them based on like, do they require a server? Do they require a smartphone application? And, and so on, like just, just to get a better feel for uh, what are their, their requirements and assumptions. So uh, I went through some of the specs, uh, including OMA, OCF, a uh, bunch of others to see what are the terms that have been used in the specs. And this is the list that I had. Uh, it's not complete, so you know uh, if you find something that's missing, uh, uh, say now or mention on the list. So bootstrapping, provisioning, onboarding, initialization, registration, commissioning, configuration, and in the next few slides, you'll you'll kind kind of see how some of these uh, SDOs have been have been using these these terms. Uh, but of course, I might be missing one or two. So, uh, so, so one of the SDOs that that we work with and are kind of interested in is the OMA lightweight M2M specification. And basically, I went through the spec to see uh, what's the term, what's the term they are using. And basically, a new IoT device needs to contact a bootstrap server, which is responsible for provisioning essential uh, information. So they refer to the fact that a server is giving credentials to the device as as provisioning. And once the device is provisioned, then it goes to, to the actual lightweight M2M servers and registers itself there. Uh, from and, and later on, this lightweight M2M server will manage the, the client device. Uh, the specification talks about four bootstrapping modes. So there's factory bootstraps, smart card, client initiated, and server initiated. Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with these, but uh, they are quite obvious. So in, in client initiated, the client is initiating the bootstrapping in server initiated, it's the server in smart card, there is 
there is a smart card and in factory there is like some some things that are burnt into the device at at, at the time of manufacture but uh, the two terms or the three terms that are used in OMA lightweight M2M is uh, bootstrap provisioning and and then registration or registers. Uh, the other SEO, another SEO that I looked at, looked at and, and perhaps you are quite interested in is uh, Open Connectivity Foundation. And this uh, SDO calls the process before a device is operational as onboarding. And the first step in, in the onboarding process is configuring the ownership of the device. So basically, if you have a new IoT device, you need to somehow configure who is the owner owner of this device and they list a bunch of owner transfer methods uh, which, which is how you will establish a owner of a new com completely blank iot device so there's the just works which is kind of like uh, bluetooth just works so you basically have an authenticated if you have an exchange and uh, if there is a man in the middle attacker then uh, well too bad so it's not completely secure uh, another mode they have is this random pin where the IoT device is supposed to generate a pin and, and show it to the user, which the user will then copy onto this onboarding tool. And onboarding tool, even though they say it can be anything, it can like run on any device. In most, most scenarios, it would be like a smartphone application. Uh, you could also use uh, manufacturer certificate, uh, though they don't really answer uh, in the spec how so like yeah a manufacturer certificate can say that this is a samsung device uh, with a serial number so and so uh, they never really say that you should also check that it's the same serial number that you show on that, that is shown on the box uh, of that iot device so it's uh, still some some open questions and then there's of course the vendor specific option where they don't say like how it's done but vendors can choose how, how they wish to establish the owner of IoT device. Uh, but the idea is that at the end of end of this uh, process, uh, there is an owner of, of this IoT device. And at the end of this, this new owner would provision or configure the device with uh, owner credentials. So basically, let's say after just works, there is some kind of a session key. And using this session key, I will send new credentials that are uh, kind of uh, that I provision or configure. And after this ownership is established, I would also send more information like where is your bootstrap server? Uh, what are the credentials that you should use with the bootstrap server? Uh, so on. But again, a, a mixture of terms. So there's onboarding, configuring, provisioning, and then there's, of course, this bootstrap server. Uh, there's also device provisioning protocol. So this is uh, a uh, specification coming out of the Wi-Fi Alliance, and it describes itself as a standardized protocol for providing user-friendly Wi-Fi setup. Uh, DPP also relies on, on configurator, so most likely it would be a smartphone application, uh, which would then help you in like setting up all your other devices, which are called enrollees in the network. And it has three sub protocols and or, or three phases. So there's the bootstrapping phase, authentication phase, configuration phase. So here, like uh, the they use provisioning as the overall step, and and then inside provisioning you have bootstrapping, authentication, and configuration. The bootstrapping step you scan QR codes or tap NFC. You run some protocol, and and then you configure new. Uh, credentials such as the SSID and passphrase of your access point. Uh, there's Z-Wave. I won't really go into uh, details of how this works. It's it's on the slide. Perhaps you can look at it later. But again, similar idea that uh, you have some kind of uh, key pair and you have a QR code that you scan potentially with a smartphone and and then there is some kind of elliptic or diffie hellman key exchange so some some similar patterns doesn't really go into the terms that much so they don't really use any of these common terms like uh, provisioning onboarding bootstrapping but rather just prescribe what what the device and and the controller should do so what are the common patterns that at least i observed uh, when i was going through so uh, it's a multi-step process. So uh, this 
to to make a iot device operational there is several steps and you know different sdos call call them by different names but uh, uh, they all tend to use asymmetric key pairs and kind of a secondary device or tool that helps you in bootstrapping typically in the form of a smartphone not necessarily some of them ha- allow you to like uh bootstrap without having this smartphone especially if you have like thousands of devices but uh for most most scenarios they assume that there is a tool or a device that assists you personal opinion i think uh, we should just say bootstrapping is the overarching term and then there are various steps inside bootstrapping whether it's in authentication and then followed by some some sort of configuration and provisioning and perhaps eventual ownership transfer uh so in the next version of the draft i plan to include the itf protocol so so in the current version i only had what other sdos are doing but i plan to include uh, how some of these terms are used within our own specs at the itf so how is enrollment used and proof key and what is uh, sztp using so on what's he keep using uh, uh that i plan to add in in the next version of the draft um the classification uh, exists from the previous version of the draft it's hard to classify bootstrapping methods but generally you can have these four categories so managed methods is where you have some sort of a server p2p or ad hoc would be some sorry i'm hearing someone's phone it's not not mine uh then you have p2p ad hoc methods uh, opportunistic leap of faith methods and most most of the methods are actually hybrid so they might use uh, initially like some kind of ad hoc setup where you pair with your smartphone but eventually use a central bootstrap server so yeah it's it's hard to classify uh, and uh, mo- most of the methods are like some some hybrid where where they use components of of both uh one thing that i would like to cover in the in the draft and i think which is uh, important and uh, fundamentally affects the bootstrapping process uh, which we haven't looked at into too much detail is how do you do reset re- device reset and ownership transfer because many of the bootstrapping protocols just assume that if if there is a new owner you just need to factory reset the device and in some cases i'm not sure if that's uh, the best idea or is even sufficient and to give a example for Uh, now on you can't really reset an android uh, factory reset an android phone unless you know the google account uh, which is there on the phone and this is like a preventive mechanism if your phone gets stolen then the thief shouldn't be allowed to just factory reset and start using your phone but of course like what if you had uh, sold legitimately sold this on a flea market but forgot to factory reset it yourself so should the next owner like go around looking for the previous owner i was also surprised to see that some of these devices actually require you to have physical access uh, before you can ro- revoke any like keys or network access that that you had allowed them so uh, at least i saw this fibaro flood sensor requires you to press a button to remove it from your network i was wondering if i have already sold it how do i go and and do that uh, they actually require you to press the button while it's next to your Uh, controller or smartphone uh, which which i find it like weird uh, so th- this is something that that is often overlooked but fundamentally affects the bootstrapping uh, process and protocol and is something that that is worth uh, looking at so what's the status it's on my personal github and i'm open to receiving pull requests and issues on github or on the mailing list both are equally welcome uh there have been some comments in the past on this draft uh, i hope there is more comments in the future and at some point perhaps we slowly move towards uh, adoption by the research group that's it any questions thank you mohit and while we see if there's more questions atir can you get ready share your presentation and you can yeah, sure in very brief fashion uh in like 5 minutes that would be great and then we can okay, maybe have a look at if in a later meeting we should have longer slot for this sure i'll try to cover it in 5 minutes yeah 
Uh, can you see the slides? If there's, yes. Uh, so if there's no questions for Mohit, please, Tiru, go ahead. Okay. Hey, hey, hello, everyone. I'm Tiru. I'll be presenting our draft uh, uh, TLS profiles for IoT devices. Uh, this draft extends MUD. Uh, MUD is a manufacturer user description specification to describe TLS interactions. Uh, MUD as such, uh, uh, it's RFC 8520, which defines uh, uh, L3, L4 ACLs for permitting intended behavior for IoT devices because IoT devices typically have a specific purpose. Uh, what we have been seeing in the last few years is uh, malware has started using TLS. More and more malwares that are coming every year are using uh, uh, TLS, uh, uh, and uh, very few uh, malwares are now using clear text. Uh, but the diff but we see a lot of differences between the way malware uses TLS versus uh, what we see TLS used by legitimate software. Uh, for instance, we see. Uh, the domain name, the subject name indicator, quite different from the subject alt name. Uh, malware uses uh, domain generation algorithms. The cipher suits and TLS extensions used by malware is quite different than what is used by uh, Benin software. Uh, malware also uses uh, self-signed uh, software. We've been uh, we're providing IoT security for several uh, IoT devices, and what we observed is that many of these IoT devices do not follow the best current practices. For instance, we've seen IoT devices which are using expired certificates, are using weak cipher suits, and many of these IoT devices come hardcoded with the same private keys. And we also see that uh, many of these IoT devices are vulnerable to server certificate validation, uh, which cause them, which uh, makes them susceptible to man in the middle attacks. For instance, a few years back, Samsung had a vulnerability where it was uh, subjected to MITM attacks because it was unable to properly validate the server certificate. Uh, the key benefits of uh, MUD TLS profiles are that it can define a uh, uh, TLS uh, profiles for IoT devices that have diverse communication patterns. Uh, it works for IoT devices even after learning new skills uh, that change their communication communication patterns, and it also helps to uh, protect IoT devices which have inadequate uh, certificate validation, which may make them susceptible to MITM attacks. Uh, so, as part of our investigation, what we had done was we have profiled several home network IoT devices. And we observed that the TLS profile parameters did not change even after learning new skills through their uh, the domains that they talk to uh, change. And uh, these D IoT devices have constrained TLS usage patterns. And the TLS profiles, even for uh, IoT devices based on device type, manufacturer, and model, was quite different. And we also observed the TLS profile parameters of thousands of uh, malware flows from McAfee Labs. And we identified that there's quite differences between the malware flows and the Benin flows that we see from these IoT devices. And we uh, uh, identified that the malicious TLS use can be identified and blocked. Uh, so as part of this draft, we have we extend the MUD uh, Young model to uh, include the observable uh, TLS profile parameters. The TLS profile parameters is uh, defined once for use, and TLS profile can also be defined specifically for specific destinations. For example, uh, firmware server using a specific private CA, so that way uh, the CAs could also be specific to specific destinations. Uh, I have various examples here. I've listed Google Chrome as an example, home as an example to see show you how the cipher suits used by Banan uh, flows on. Um, a Google Home is quite different from the cipher suits used by malware flows. And the protocol versions were also different that uh, a malware was using prior TLS versions and the Binance flows were using TLS 1.2 and higher. The number of extensions were also different. Uh, extension types differed. Uh, groups and all the most of the parameters we saw quite a bit of differences between the way malware and uh, 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 bin and flows for behaving on uh, Google Home and various other IoT devices, uh, which help us conclude that uh, uh, TLS profile parameters uh, uh, can be defined, which helps us to identify and permit uh, good flows and bla uh, block the malicious. Uh, uh, TLS flows, and and the bigger challenge for malware agents is that they won't be able to mimic the TLS profiles of several IoT device types and make and model coming from uh, several manufacturers, and they won't be able to uh, keep up with the updates to the TLS profiles. Uh, <clears throat> 
we also identified that uh, uh, even without acting as a TLS proxy, uh, by just looking at the client hello, uh, several of the malwares could be successfully identified. For example, we could identify a malware uh, which was using uh, uh, Cypher suit randomization, and that could be uh, detected by just looking at the client hello message. Uh, uh, acting as a full blown TLS proxy requires you to be compliant with. Uh, with uh, with the TLS proxy discussed in TLS 1.3 specification, it may or may not be possible in all the deployment scenarios. And uh, uh, just to conclude, I mean, uh, we are looking for more comments and suggestions on the draft, and we would like to collaborate to profile uh, benign and malware flows on IoT devices. Uh, any comments? Thank you, Kiru. That was that was very good. Hey, I was just I trying to finish it. Yeah. Uh, uh, very good. Uh, hi. Uh, so, uh, Thiru, I have uh, three quick questions, which I'll go in in one go, and then you can see if there is time to answer. So, one, this looks like uh, IETF work than than IRTF, but I don't really care where this this work is done. It's up to you and chairs and and other people. Second question: This seems like a typical cat and mouse game that currently malware doesn't use this kind of cipher suits and you will start filtering them and they would eventually move to the same cipher suits that that is used by google or kind of the same same parameter so it's it's like a temporary cat and mouse game that we might win but eventually i feel that they would use exactly the same protocol versions i see there is no reason why malware would use tls1 and not 1.3 or particular mode of aes and not not the other mode of aes so that's that that that's another thing that kind of worries me. Uh, the third thing, the measurements you have done currently don't cover the cases which will actually cause you problems later on. How often are Google devices moving from t uh, one version of TLS to another? And my worry is that when eventually they update the software or firmware, uh, the mm -hmm. profile would not be updated at the same time because you know the mud profile is from from this URL. So things might actually break when you start updating like to a new curve or to a new protocol because those things happen so rarely that there is no way to do coverage testing for that. So that's something to consider that if it might break things. Hey, hey thanks, uh, uh, Mohit. I mean, all the valid questions. So I'll just answer quickly each of them and we can take it offline. So this draft is currently dis discussed in the operations and management working group. So uh, the reason why I brought it to the research group was since many of the IoT devices, especially the home uh, IoT devices, don't support uh, uh, MUD, we were looking for a way to collaborate and profile Benin and malware flows. Uh, the second question regarding malware catching up and uh, exhibiting the same behavior as Benin flows, yes, that's a possibility. And we have been, uh, I, I work for McAfee, and we have been seeing the malware behavior for several years, and they always catch up. But the challenge here is they can't catch up in a way that they mimic the behavior of the TLS profile on each and every IoT device. For instance, uh, the malware has to tailor itself so that they use the same TLS profiles. And from our observation, the TLS profiles for each of these IoT devices, even with different uh, models, was different from each manufacturer. So unless the malware uh, manufacturer, uh, malware provider comes up with a way that he tailors his malware to uh, be specific for each IoT device type, make it model, it's going to be really impossible because they typically use a rootkit and it's going to be really uneconomical for them to basically suit and tailor their malware for each IoT device. Uh, the third question was, yes, uh, this, this requires uh, whenever a firmware update happens, the TLS version may change. And OPS AWG is discussing a draft uh, which discusses that whenever the firmware version changes, the, the URL gets updated and the new profile gets fetched from the manufacturer. Thank you, Tiro. And um, in the interest of time, we need to take the rest of the questions uh, on, on the mailing list. Sure. Um, but Xavier, you will be next. Please go, go ahead and, and start the presentation. And we have quite a lot of. No, we don't have much much time. I'm afraid we might be going a few minutes over time. Um, but still, try to make it through the presentation. Please go ahead. Xavier, we don't hear you if you're talking. Thank you, Ari. So I'd like to present the status of the draft IoT edge computing challenges and functions on behalf of my co-authors. 
So let's start with the uh, uh, with a short history of the draft. I will go quickly on that one. So we presented the first time in ITF uh, 103, and uh, there was a discussion in ITF 104 uh, on uh, Edge and IoT you know, in the T2TLG meeting, where this draft was considered a possible starting point for a group document to uh, kick off this activity. So between this ITF and the next, a new co-authors joined, and in ITF 105, we presented a renamed version of the draft. In, uh, it was integrated with a survey and gap analysis, so a presentation made earlier in T2TRG. So uh, in ITF 106, we presented uh, version one of this renamed uh, draft, where the focus changed from uh, use case examples to edge function analysis and from one edge architecture to covering a range of models. So today I'm presenting version two and three of this, uh, this draft. Uh, we reorganized the draft, we extended the background section and the list of functions. Uh, so in terms of updates, we made the edit editorial and clarification edits in all sections, especially we kind of rewrote the abstract and introduction. Uh, we reorganized the draft, so now you have like three main sections. You have the background, challenges, and uh, edge computing functions. And we extended the background uh, section on edge computing to cover different understandings of edge, you know, depending on people's background. So the background can be in cloud, telco industry, or industrial automation. And we also expanded on the term fog to give it somewhat of an equal weight in this section. We extended uh, section five to detail the, the list of functions, including detailed challenges, uh, functions, you know, which are listed here on the, on the left, uh, can be present in some or all models, you know, either centralized or decentralized. And the, the models are still covered at the beginning of the section five. Uh, functions are loosely classified as OAM functional and application components. Uh, this classification, we are aware of that it's, uh, you know, it could be made better uh, or, or, you know, it, it's not always, what I, what I mean is that it's not always very clear in some systems. Some systems will be, will see more integration between these different uh, layers, but it's not prescriptive and it's called, cool. it's just to be, uh, you know, to clarify the text. Uh, so we, we have the, this list here. Uh, maybe I won't go through the list for the sake of time, uh, but basically um, each, you know, each section, section will, you know, describe this, um, uh, you know, this function and some challenges associated to it. And we added a 5.4 on simulation and emulation environments. It's, uh, you know, covering not only open source tools, but also the current Etsy Mac Sandbox initiative, for example. So as a note for reviewers, so section four and five both have challenges you know, research challenges uh, listed. Uh, section four describes challenges on the IoT leading to the adoption of edge computing. And section five covers different types of challenges, you know, associated with uh, individual edge computing functions. So we don't want to hold off any, you know, reviewers. So uh, please, you know, if you wish to review this document, please be aware that uh, those are, you know, uh, different types of, of challenges will be covered in different places in there. So um, we have also a short uh, version three update that we made uh, based on in part on some comments from uh, Router on the on the list. So we had we added several clarifications, including that uh, end devices can be uh, computing nodes, and also we expanded on the mobility support challenge. So this is the last slide. So we believe the um, the draft is in stable state in terms of content and structure. Um, there are still some areas we think need to be improved, huh, clearly, but we would like to gather some feedback and base those improvements on the feedback you know, from, from reviewers. So we would like to highlight just a few points for people who wish to uh, review the doc. First, you know, as mentioned uh, in the last slide, uh, please be aware of the relationship between challenges in section four and five. Uh, then um, the models uh, we have for IoT edge computing in section five can be uh, extended. 
some of the, for example, some of the co-authors have made some progress on distributed models and uh, would like to uh, share some insights in there. So they will probably, uh, we will probably update that, but maybe after, after a range of uh, first uh, set of reviewers, uh, provide some comments possibly. And um, individual functions uh, descriptions in section five can also be developed further for, you know, especially in the detailed challenges. So for, for now, the level of the details in the section can be a bit unequal. Some, some sections have uh, research challenges listed and some don't. Uh, we, we need to work on that, but also the input from the group would be uh, greatly appreciated on, on this. Um, finally, I mean, the security related contributions and comments are also welcome. So to conclude, the draft is now available for the research group to review and to consider for uh, research group adoption. So uh, questions uh, I would like to ask uh, to the chairs, you know, is this a proper time to request uh, research? What, you, what would be your uh, your advice on, on this? In any case, uh, I'm, I'm done with the presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Savi. So, um, Mohit is in the queue, but before uh, we go to his uh, question, could I ask everyone who would be interested in providing some review of this draft to send a plus one to the WebEx chat so we can gauge uh, the uh, interest. Just send plus one. And uh, Mori, please. I'm not in the queue. Uh, that plus queue was for the last presentation. Oh, yeah, that's the same mistake we always make. Thank you. <laughs> so, Koinaji, you are Marie Jose? I'm, uh, I'm in the, uh, the regal we today. I'm the coin RG. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, two people who uh, plus one uh, for a review. Uh, so I think we have to take this to the list. Um, I think we do need a couple of, of uh, uh, reviews uh, to assess whether this uh, can go ahead as a research group document. I would re want to remind people that when they write the reviews, um, the, the criteria for, for accepting something as a research group document is that we consider the work useful, not that we agree with every point of view that the authors have taken. So research group documents do not need to be consensus documents. They need to be useful uh, documents. So if, if a document is a great way to, to document uh, a view that is opposite to yours, you might still be interested to have it uh, published as a research uh, group document. So with that, I think we are done. Sorry. Indeed. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And apologies for running a few minutes late. And just a reminder this was a, a summer meeting where we give a quick overview of a variety of topics we're working on. If you're interested in working on the details, please join the discussion on the mailing list, join the upcoming work meetings that we always announce on the mailing list. Look forward to seeing many of you contributing on all the upcoming activities in the future. Bye-bye.